I, I see a, a quite a few new faces, so thank you all for making the trek down here. A little bit about our group. This is our, well, I won't say the month. Uh, we're, we're almost two years old. We started in Louisville uh, back in May of the 2012. Uh, so give yourselves a round of uh, applause because our average is about 40 or 45 people. We always meet in the in here, the, the basement of Miller's Grill, which is really nice because that's what the founders did when they were talking about the Constitution. And we think that's a pretty special. Uh, our speaker tonight, Mike Donifon, is the mayor of Glendale. And before that, he was on the Planning and Zoning Commission for 17 years. Uh, after that, he was on city council for four, and I believe he was the vice mayor or uh, deputy mayor for another <laughs> vice. few years. Uh, after that, he was elected just two years ago to be the mayor of Glendale, and he told me that in the last 14 months, they have repealed one law every month. <laughs> Without further ado, Mr. Mike Dunnapon. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Um, some of us made a big trek, but it's imagine we're in a nice car, not in a wagon, having to run across uh, the prairies in a wagon. The, all the things that we forget that our forefathers did for us, some of us knew them and can remember what it was like. Well, I got into a, uh, I got into politics in a very strange way. As I believe everybody should get into politics, somebody should put a gun to your head. Because nobody should really want to do this. And there's a key to all this. If they do want to do it, don't vote for them. Because why in the world would anybody spend millions of dollars to get in an office that pays hundreds of dollars? That's kind of a simple equation, isn't it? You ride up on a Shetland pony and ride away on a thoroughbred. And you didn't own the Shetland pony. Well, many years ago, I, tr I tried my hand at football. I could get into college and get my college paid for, unbeknownst to me that I wasn't really going to college to get an education once I started playing football. And a whole different agenda. Plus there wasn't any time to go to class, right? So I went to the university and no, no credit. Do we have any other UNC grads here? <laughs> go Bears. And they'd always recruit the guys in the springtime, right? It was seven to one women. That's how they had good athletes up there. It had nothing to do with a football program. So I got out of there and played with the Broncos for a while. Got hurt playing with the Broncos and did the Torobolium. Grew a ponytail. Had a big beard. Traded my house for a sailboat. Now you don't do the ponytails. They call them skullets now when you get to be my age. They're not mullets anymore. They're skullets. Most ridiculous looking thing I've ever seen. There goes a skullet. I always point them out. So during that time, I'm overseas, living in the British Virgin Islands, and I discover rugby. One day, a fellow walks down the dock and knocks on the hull of the boat, and he says, right, mate, you fancy a game of footy. I said, footy? Oh, football without pads? No, thank you. No. So we have a long conversation, and he convinces me that, and this is how he did it. But bloody well, we're going across, uh, across to have a, a piss-up with the, the Royal Marines on the warship. I look across, there's a warship. I said, you're going to have a drink with the fellows you're playing against. You're joking. I said, okay, I'm in. He says, have you got a blazer? I said, a blazer? You don't play rugby in blazers, do you? For the piss-up, mate, for the piss-up. <laughs> so they find this carpet-bagger thing for me to wear. And we go and there's the governor, the captain, the Royal Marines, and a bunch of the roughest looking guys you've ever seen singing together, why, 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 Delilah. <laughs> so the next day we go out and we play against the Royal Marines. I never, from 
you know, from a low level in the NFL to, to playing on a runway in a foreign country, they beat me to death. But I learned something about it. It was truly a sport. There really was this ethos of competitive collaboration, agreeing to compete with one another for the lessons in life are revealed by competition and loss. And when you, when you prevent somebody from losing, you do a dreadful, dreadful thing to them. You take their soul away from them. They don't have an opportunity to truly be faced with the lessons in life that require you find out who you are. So all this time I'm in a foreign country and I'm, I'm talking about America to the Brits, refusing to stand up for God Save the Queen. That made me very popular on the rugby team. <laughs> So I come back to the United States and I think I know what America is all about. I've been living in a foreign country that was immensely corrupt. In fact, it was too small to be effectively corrupt. What I mean by that is you've got to have a certain amount of size before the corruption can be hidden from the other corrupt party that wants to. So you've got a grease bucket. In a small country, that grease bucket goes to all four families running the show. Don't grease. Forget it. Just let them march it down to the end of the dock, which they'd do occasionally because I was a little bit verbose about my American beliefs, to deport me. And But they wouldn't really, and we'd go back and drink together and talk about politics. Well, I never thought that that little education I was getting in the British Virgin Islands, which, by the way, is an offshore banking. Uh, it's a protector to the British crown would come in handy sometime later. I had no idea. So I come back to the United States and I've started an international callback company. In the modification of final judgment in 1984, Judge Green broke up the bell systems. Remember, everybody thought Ma Bell was so wonderful. They'd give you a phone and they'd come in and fix the phone line and not charge you. Well, it was only costing you about 40 times more than you should have been paying for it. Long distance phone calls. You would say back then, I'm on, I'm on the phone long distance. Well, it's three bucks a minute back when three bucks was still worth a dollar, right? Instead of 22 cents. Well, the Bell system started rerouting their traffic to try to get what was called proportional return. So they're getting money from foreign countries coming in because of the international agreements with phone companies. So I reckoned, wait a minute. Couldn't we go to these small Caribbean islands and change the balance of trade based on which direction the phone dollars went? And you could. So I would go to St. Lucia, St. Bart's, and all these places, talk to the chief ministers and say, look, mate, you can change the direction the money flows into this country. Millions of dollars. Judge Green was happy to see it happen because the U.S. was losing, on balance, $60 billion a year. So that was my first instance of getting in a fight with a company called Cable and Wireless, an absolute monopoly in the Caribbean. They were charging $12 a minute from a hotel to call home. Well, with callback, which means you dial in. Remember callback when you're in college? You call and hang up. And if that happened at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, Grandma called you back immediately because you were in need of 100 bucks, right? That's how that worked. That was callback. So what the computer would do is not give answer supervision and call you back and give you dial tone as if you're making the call from the United States. Well, this was driving cable and wireless batshit. Because you could take that $12 phone call a minute and make it two and only pay 40 cents for the traffic. Now, I thought, what a great idea. This will be solely embraced by everybody who is a capitalist. Not so much. They did everything they could possibly do to crush the company, along with me getting an audited financial from KPMG Pete Mark Part Marwick that was a fraud. So I started stacking up these lessons. What in the world? This isn't the belief system I had. It's supposed to be fair play. It's supposed to be for the good of, of the order, as the Brits would say. It wasn't. None of it was. 
So I go to a Christmas party, and I, I'm raising money for the phone company, and I meet Debbie Matthews. Well, it turns out that her father, date, her mother dated my father in 1945. We both come from, she comes from Morrison, I come from Golden. I said, you're joking, right? We have subsequently uh, gotten our alleles checked to make sure that we're not brother and sister. <laughs> Because there was some doubt. <laughs> Which would be handy with the IRS, actually. Think about it. You can't force me to marry her. That's my sister. <laughs> we, cannot, we cannot file jointly under any circumstances. <laughs> well, unbeknownst to me, she had started a business in 1982. And she comes to me after we've been dating three or four months. She has a little farmhouse, right? Country girl. I was raised, you know, rodeo cowboys and ranches. There's a politician trying to put me out of business. I said, oh, yeah, that zoning thing. I, I, you got some, you got some, you got to put some cattle on there to keep that A2 zoning. It's not that. What is it? Well, I founded and own and operate a little business called Shotgun Willies. Oh. Do you own a strip joint? Sweet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And it turned out there was a little mayor named Joe Rice that decided he did not, and this is a gosh truth, he did not like the fact that every time somebody called City Hall in Glendale and they had to give them directions to City Hall, nobody knew where it was, right? They would inevitably have to say, do you know where shotguns, oh God, yes, uh, <laughs> sure, where, where are you from Shotgun? Shotguns is the number five landmark in Colorado. It's true. Right in front of the U.S. Mint. Behind? I don't think so anymore. So, Mr. Rice decides to put her out of business. They're going to pass an ordinance, ordinance number four series in 1998, declaring that she had to have lighting, much like this, tip poles, so you wouldn't get near that woman with a tip, right? Unbelievable. I said, well, Joe, why don't you just put a berm around it and wall it off? I mean, people, nobody's, they're not getting handcuffed and forced through the door. Then they dummied police reports. False police reports. They got caught with that one in a public meeting when the police chief would not lie under oath. Surprise. Well, four days after the ordinance was passed, or three days, a fellow named Rod Brown, interesting character, calls Debbie and said he'd like to have lunch with her. And she invites me to the lunch, wherein Mr. Brown takes a tube of plans out, pops them out of the tube, rolls them out, and says, it's a coincidence, but I just happen to have these plans for your property. How much would you like for it? I have a suggested price. We're going to put an office building on the corner. I said, what a coincidence, Rod. If the young man wasn't here, I'd tell you exactly what I said to Rod. Tell us anyway. There were capital F's, all caps, bold. <laughs> yes, yeah. for heaven's sake, Rod. <laughs> so, um, what are we going to do? Well, we could make it a civil suit, sue, and then uh, take it to the Supreme Court? Sure, right. You're out of business. All of those time, place, and manner regulations were offshoots of the Detroit Skid Row 50s studies that were done to put pool halls out of business. Time, place, and manner regulations. And Mr. Rice had asked the National Family Legal Foundation to come into town. So now we had our good friend James, Dob James Dobson, Charles Keating, Ed Meese, all deciding how to put her out of business. Now, they had been successful 481 times prior to this. What do we do? Well, politics will be the only answer for this problem. 
What did we do? Well, I wrote a name down on a napkin. I said, why, why don't we throw rice in the harbor instead of tea? Let's, <laughs> let's call this the Glendale Tea Party. So it is still registered in the state in 1998. It's the first tea party, the Glendale Tea Party. It's uh, much more in line with the thinking of the people in this room, not some of the people in Colorado Springs, believe me. So Debbie then lines up some gorgeous women, free beer tickets and voter registration cards, and <laughs> sends them out. <laughs> yeah. Like locusts in the night. So they swoop in on all the apartments. Say, Glendale has two single-family homes, and one of them is occupied. The rest of it is high-density housing. So a, a little aside about when you're sending a woman out that works in that industry, they're very difficult to, to shock or to say no to. They are ardent and effective capitalists. <laughs> they know the meaning of innuendo. So in this particular apartment complex, they're canvassing, and they keep looking up on the fourth floor, and there's a chappy who's fully attired in his shower thongs and an erection that keeps coming out to them. <laughs> and they're working their way up to the fourth floor, right? So they get to his door. Two of them standing there, gorgeous. And he answers in all his splendor. They registered him to vote and said by the time he signed it, you couldn't see it. <laughs> now that is an army. We quadrupled the voter rolls and threw them all out of office. <laughs> and ended up with a situation where everybody thought it was a B movie. Oh, strip club, um, goomba, you know, look at me, call me an Italian. That's a stretch. So I had to run a city. I don't know how to run a city, and I don't want to be in politics. Well, the first thing is, you take a look at the books and say, well, you've got to fire half of them. So we got rid of half the employees in the city. Awesome. <laughs> the next thing is, they were putting in some taxes. We fought those and beat them. The next thing, it just kept going like that until eventually we took the bond rating from a double B to a double A minus, um, capital projects. We, we founded the newspaper because the Post and the Rocky wouldn't tell the truth. And that's still in existence. It's, it's, uh, when I became a city councilman, I did not want to have any editorial control over that newspaper, so we both sold our interest in it. It goes out to just under 100 house, thousand households. It's a very, very popular newspaper, and it is a problem for the, for the politicians in that zone. So that brings me here tonight. That's a loose-knit version of all the things that happened along the way. We're in a situation in this country where we have surrendered and now are asking ourselves, do we have time to rescind the document? Now, we didn't surrender on purpose. Those of us that are going to work every day are paying for the people that attack us, and that's a real problem. So I wrote some remarks, and I'll, I've been admonished for using my nook in the pack. Could you hold that for me? Um, because, it, uh, because I get off into reading the thing, and... Um, I started really thinking about what our problem is and how we change it. We have given up something that I think is the essence of the American spirit, humor. And we've had, we've had it taken from us very slowly, not all at once. And so tonight I want to speak about things that matter. Now things that matter on face value you would say, oh. You know, in our society today, what matters? Opinion? Yeah, opinion matters. Unless it's not backed up by anything. And then it's useless, worthless. 
We no longer believe that facts matter or that any fundamental truths exist. Someplace along the way, we seem to have lost our ability to articulate the things that really matter. How did this happen? Well, for the first time in our long history in this country, we have relinquished our sense of humor. You see, humor cuts to the truth. And to coin a phrase from our childhood, it cuts to the heart of the matter like a speeding bullet. Lies don't bear up under humor. Now, the left has told us that humor is a zero-sum game. It's, there's a winner and a loser in humor. What we're ignoring in that statement is the fact that it isn't a zero-sum game if you understand both sides of the joke. In other words, you can be the brunt of your own joke. You can laugh at yourself. And every time those emotions hit, you remember them. You attach the emotion of that humor to a lesson. And that was the sublime humor that went along with the old guys or the old women in your life sitting back in the kitchen or out in the corral just waiting for you to pour some boiling water on your foot or have a horse stand on you because he knew those lessons didn't kill you. But if you learned those lessons and you could laugh at yourself, there was real hope for you. Because you would learn those lessons that didn't kill you before you had to learn the lessons that might kill you. And furthermore, and this they didn't articulate this to themselves, furthermore, you would learn the lessons that kept society alive, that developed a culture, that created a scenario where you could lose. And if you really weren't very good at something, you needed to go find what you were good at doing not surrender or ask somebody else to do it for you. You know, for most of our country, the arguments that we articulated could be remembered in the punchline. They all came back to you. Now, why don't people tell Jonestown, Jim Jones jokes? Anybody know the answer to that? Not funny. Punchline's too long. <laughs> oh, oh, horrible. You'll never forget it. <laughs> See, now we can't say those sort of things anymore, can we? See, he's going to ask you until you finally tell him. <laughs> and those that wouldn't drink the Kool-Aid got shot in the head. Wrong place. Wrong idea. Guiana with Reverend Jones. So think about economics. Economics, we believe we can't understand economics. There's no possible way when we're talking about quantitative easing, we're talking about all of this nonsense and Keynesian economics and, and the battle between the Keynesians. And by the way, I wish there really was a battle between Keynes and Hayek because we know who would win. There is on YouTube. Yes, I've seen it. And, the, and my favorite book of his is The Fatal Conceit rather than The Road to Serfdom because that is The Fatal Conceit. So think of stories that you could be told about economics. Well, here's one dealing with business ethics. Every year, Mrs. Rabinowitz goes to the furrier in the spring to put her fur in for the winter. And every year, this lovely old lady hands the furrier a brand new $100 bill. Beautiful. It's a tradition. This year, she's mistakenly handed him two $100 bills that are stuck together, unbeknownst to her. So the furrier calls his rabbi and says, oh, I have a dilemma. He said, well, come see me. Come see me. He said, what's your dilemma? He said, Mrs. Rabinowitz, as she does every year, she comes and gives me the $100 bill. And this year, there were two of them stuck together. I said, What's the dilemma? Do I tell my partner? No. <laughs> and we don't tell Mrs. Rabinowitz either. 
See, if we're not together in all this, it develops a real problem. And we don't talk about the fact that these short-term gains represent massive long-term losses. A miserable old man has died. Everybody hated him, but he was so filthy rich that everybody pretended to like him. And they all packed the church for his memorial service. And his three most trusted friends, his priest, his accountant, or his lawyer, and his doctor have gathered and they've done something for him that he demanded he, that they do. He was going to take it with him. So each was instructed to put a million dollars in that coffin. So the lawyer notices that the doctor and the priest are off in the corner commiserating and the priest is crying. So he approaches him. He said, you certainly can't be sad at the loss of this man. He said, that's not it. We didn't do what he asked us to do. You betrayed the wishes of a dying man. You, what did you do? The doctor said, I, I didn't put half of it in there. I donated to the children's hospital. And the priest said, oh, it's worse for me. He said, we need a roof on the rectory. He said, I don't know if there's, I don't know, maybe 100,000 in the casket. Lawyer said, that's despicable. Can you imagine? As much as you hated him, you have sold your integrity by cheating a dead man. I will have you know that I wrote him a personal check for the full amount. <laughs> now, how much rationalization do we always see when it comes to these matters? How many people read Hans Hermann Hoppe? Theory of Socialism and Capitalism. Talks about the real meaning of private property. Where does private property come from? And in that debate that is going on right now, shouldn't we be talking about private property when we're talking about minimum wage and whether or not somebody has a livable wage and how much that wage should be increased? Well, Hans Hermann Hoppe draws a convincing argument that the axiomatic meaning of private property is your body and you are the sole and only owner of a scarce resource, your body. And that's an irrefutable argument. So that brings me to the concept of potentially and realistically. Little boy comes home to his father. He says, um, Dad, I need to know that the difference between potentially and realistically. So that's an interesting question. How in the world can I get you to remember this? He said, all right, here, go ask your mother, your sister, and your brother if they would sleep with Brad Pitt for a million dollars. Well, okay. <laughs> Comes back with the answer. What did they say? They would all do it. Hmm. All right, son. That means potentially you and I are sitting on three million bucks. <laughs> Realistically, we're living with two prostitutes and a future United States senator. <laughs> yeah, there's a bit of a lesson in that. So it's a slow day in a small town. Wealthy tourists is coming through the town tired and decides that he wants to spend the night in the hotel. So he goes into the local hotel and meets the hotelier and he said, uh, I'm not quite sure this accommodation meets my needs. Mind if I have a look, I'll leave a hundred dollars on the counter. So he leaves a hundred bucks on the counter, at which point the hotelier runs out to pay the grocer. And the grocer then takes the hundred dollar bill and goes and pays the farmer who sold him the hog that became the ham. And the farmer owns the co-op some money, so he goes down to the co-op and gives the $100 bill to pay his co-op off. The co-op fellow, realizing that he has not paid the local uh, lady of the night, 
And she, in dire straits, has been take, giving her services on credit, so she goes straight to the hotel and pays off her room bill. At which time the fellow comes down, and he said, these uh, accommodations don't meet my standards, and takes his $100 bill. <laughs> so everybody's happy. All the bills have been paid. And there's a bright light on the horizon because it seems that credit works. And that is how the U.S. government is doing business for a long time. So the last little story, you're driving along through the night, and you take a look at three people at a bus stop. One of them appears to be an old lady that's dying. The other is your best friend who saved your life. The third, you somehow know, is the love of your life. Now your problem is you can only take one of them with you. So think about which one you would take. You could save the old lady's life. You could repay your best friend. Or you could meet the love of your life on that night. So what would you do? Hand the keys to your best friend. Let him take the old lady to a hospital. Sit with the love of your life in a bus stop waiting in the rain and solve your problem. That means that you think outside the box. And that is our challenge. We must think outside the box because we are faced with an overwhelming, misinformed, lazy, slovenly, powerful enemy that is dedicated to destroying every facet of individual liberty. So embrace the challenge and understand. I call it carp fishing. Critical analysis rejects propaganda. If it smells like a dead carp, it is a dead carp. Learn the arguments. Have a sense of humor. Don't be so serious that as much as you'd like to just whack one of them. Once in a while, but don't don't have a witness. <laughs> that is the challenge that we face, and I believe we can win. Chris just told me we hit 20,000 tonight. We're shooting for 60,000. Those who don't know it, it was a put up or shut up kind of deal. We started on, on June 28th saying, look, use social media. And I had prepared remarks on, on the Arab Spring and how that worked. And uh, if you read um, Eric Hoffer, there's a great book on, very interesting guy. If you don't want to shoot yourself at the end of reading Hoffer's book on social movements, he, oh my God. Primary thing he says is you don't necessarily need a God, but you need a devil. Well, if you're going to have a, a powerful social movement, you need to point out where the devil is. And the devil is socialism, the devil is groupthink, the devil is associated with relinquishing the rights to your body and the opportunity to live your own life as you see fit. So I truly believe we can do this, but we've got to get the word out, we've got to use social media, we have to be smart, we don't need to be anarchists. That's just exactly what the other side wants. And there are more of us than them, by far. But we have to have a sense of humor, and we have to be smart. So with that, thank you, and I'll open it up for questions. It takes too long. Any questions? Get the hell out of here. Oh, come on. <laughs> hey, all right. Hey, you told us how many laws you had gotten rid of. Yeah. How many have you made? None. None? No, the, uh, the only thing that we do is, it's a matter of public hearing, is you have to do, every year by statute, you have to do um, your budgets. You've got to fund the departments. You've got to do that sort of thing. We have not. In fact, we rescinded our law prohibiting the transfer of assault weapons. What's We're, an assault weapon? Ass assault weapon is a thing that looks like an assault weapon, but it's really a rifle. Yeah. <laughs> It's a dangerous. It's a dangerous-looking stick with an idiot on one end. Then it's an assault weapon. Now, one's a tool. The person's the weapon. I guess you'd say. Yes. Not to undermine your accomplishments, 
but which you're going to do now. <laughs> I, I did happen to check the municipal code for my office and noticed three laws that uh, could uh, stand to go there, uh, namely in the prohibited weapons category, like uh, you know, knives and stuff. So I've just nominated these. these. <laughs> Not prohibited. If it's longer than that, yeah, yeah. Um, now, for instance, you know it takes, it takes as long to get rid of a law as it does to make one is the problem. Because if you just started taking them off the books without public hearings, then you would exclude people from the public hearings. So we've asked people, and please send it, we'll get rid of it. But we started, we had a bar owner there, have a bar owner there. She's been there for 32 years. She's been out of compliance because we were not aware of the fact that it was against the law to have pay pool tables in Glendale. So we took that one on and got rid of it. We actually had one in our, our kids' zone in the rec center. So we were in noncompliance on our own law. It was, also, it was also against the law to have outdoor speakers. Where did that, that come from? Well, we have a stadium with outdoor speakers. So we thought, well, we should get rid of that one. So please send them in. We'll get rid of them. Uh, we, we hold the public hearing process as we should. We give proper public notice because somebody may want to come in and say, I don't want you to get rid of the samurai sword law. <laughs> oh, fine. Do you have a samurai sword? No. And, and by the way, we're putting a, an automatic shooting weapon, automatic weapons range club in the Riverwalk. That's, we've been threatened. Uh, some of the anchor properties won't come here. Well, then don't come here. Don't come here. So, yes? Start asking for these specific laws. What's the right way to, to do it? Or somebody um, wants to start doing the research on this. For, um, Read the code. Well, I mean, how do, what, and send me an email, and and what we'll do is put it on the agenda. Is the code all online? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So a follow-on question to that: Have you thought about reaching out to other local communities and helping them do something similar? <laughs> you ought to go to a metro mayor's meeting. <laughs> oh, we're in deep shit. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I, I, I really have, but it, uh, it, it, Amendment 64. Amendment 60, the Metro Mayor's Caucus does a consensus. Now, there's a communist word, consensus. I don't know what it means in Russian, but it's not good. <laughs> Let's reach consensus. Well, the Metro Mayor's Caucus only required one mayor to say no, and they could not come to consensus. So Amendment 64... I said, look, this war on marijuana, this war on a word, is a trumped-up deal from DuPont and Hearst. And if you look at the history of it, you'll discover it was a war on hemp because they had forests and processes for making wood pulp. So I did a 28-page research paper, gave it to the Metro Mayor's Caucus, and said, no consensus. So they were not able to come out against Amendment 64. I, it wouldn't have made any difference. It passed so overwhelmingly. The point was, get educated about this and quit playing this game that's killing thousands and thousands of people, putting people in the 60s in Mississippi in jail for life for joint. A war on a word. So they could not come out against it. What did they do? Now it takes five dissenters not to have consensus. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a Republican committee or something. Yeah. <laughs> They're all the same. One's on crack, the other's on quaaludes. They're the same people. <laughs> yeah. Let's go back over there. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you had a book out on marijuana. No, not these. I do write jokes, but I generally can't say them in public. <laughs> No, I, I, that, that's one of the reasons I did this is because I never forget jokes. And I want to put them in the right order. But if you remember a joke, you can remember the, the moral behind it. And there is always something funny or we wouldn't be laughing. It, it touches us in some way. If we get that sense of humor back, have you met a progressive with a sense of humor? They, I, all they do is hate. They hate you. I mean, just turn the TV on and watch what they do. They're the most thin-skinned group of people I've ever seen. They can't laugh at themselves, and that's a real problem. That means that they are miserable on this earth, and that's why they're looking for utopia. 
They're going to fix this problem. They didn't get, somebody stole their lunch money. Okay. Why don't you become a lawyer and put them in jail? Do something. Take the, uh, incredible. No dodgeball. We'll get rid of dodgeball. We'll get rid of competition. We'll get, competition is bad. Competition is bad. Well, what happens when you oppress all the competition and you take the spirit and life out of the people that are paying for your social welfare programs? You are now responsible for the black market, communism, all of the bad things that they said humans were. Without every, and they will redeem you in a, what was the law that we, a rethinking or re-education now? We have a re-education? Now, isn't that an, a, an interesting thing? Wouldn't you have to be educated first? Well, there were 15,000 of them passed in the state of Colorado last year. It comes back to my ear. Well, we can win this. We can win this. If, I, if for some strange reason I became governor, the first thing I would do is let all the nonviolent offenders out of jail. Boom, out. Now, I would ask that they become productive in some way. Now, no insurance company will hire these. You can't get insured. Well, maybe you could. I'm on the board of Step 13, which is we don't take any government money, and we make sure that people hire people in recovery so they can develop a record of employment that gets them another job. Well, if they're costing us $28,000 a, a year in jail, why don't we put an ankle bracelet on them? You got a 10-year sentence, spend half of it with the ankle bracelet on, and give the guy hiring him half the rebate and save the other half for the state. Why wouldn't we do something like that? Because it does away with the poverty industry. Recidiviz recidivization. Those people are called poverty pimps. They live on the misery of people. All the while talking about a, what a wonderful thing they're doing for them. I would veto everything that had anything to do with taking somebody's liberty away until I forced the Republicans and the Democrats out of absolute exasperation to come together and overcome the veto and then I would hold a press conference and announce them man and wife, we finally see who you are. And it's true. They never keep their word. Now talk about an easy job. I'm not sitting around negotiating with people. No. Not doing that. No. No. Evie Hudak never thought she would pay for what she did. And I, I was on the Glenn Beck show with the guys from Pueblo, and the Republican Party, Ryan Call, went against him. Think of that. We do. <laughs> so, more questions? No? Nope. Well, thank you very much. I hope I wasn't too long winded. And Go, go on the Facebook page and like me. If, if we get to, to 60,000, we're at 20 right now, we got until April 6th to do it, I'll petition onto the ballot as an unaffiliated, run for governor, hopefully get in the debates. We won't owe a thing to anybody except us. And it uh, be a lot of fun standing up there with old John and whoever the other side picks. Ballot, will you be self-funding so you don't have to worry about any of these ridiculous campaign finances? I'm not going to fund anything. It's all, uh, I'll fund my gas money. Gotcha. I'll drive around and talk to people. So you won't be taking any donations? Right None. Today. It'll just be on here, vote for me, thanks. And the reason for that? If it at all works, if we are polling at 20%, without taking any money, look at the message. That's a frightening message to the to the left and the right. The people with their little cell phone, their smart device in their hands, just like the Arab Spring, they can communicate in 140 characters with one another and outmaneuver the intelligence agencies. So the next thing you're going to see happen is they will start controlling or attempting to control that. The most terrifying thing to a centralized authority is in this room. The people. Without us, they would have to go to work. And the intellectual foot soldiers, the intellectual elites, can't do anything. Ever see one of them change a tire? 
They'd be running around on square wheels without us. And I learned that on the ranch. That's why they started dude ranches. These characters can't ride. <laughs> so thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate it. You got it. <laughs> Listen to the old man. Listen to the old man. Listen to the old man when you can.